Praise the Lord. So good to be behind the pulpit, bringing forth the Word of God. Would you turn this morning in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at that. I'm there already. <laughs> Verse 7. And it says this, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. The end of all things, sermon title, end of all things. Think of what Peter writing to the church here. The end of all things, but the end of all things is at hand. The whole idea of being at hand. Think of it like within reach. Do you ever at the dinner table and ask somebody to hand you something and you know they're, they're, it's right there but you, you hand it to them and then they reach for it and it's right at hand, it's right near, it's, it's within your grasp. The end of all things is at hand. And when the Bible says all things, all, all things is right here. 2100 years ago saying Peter right into the church the end of all things is right real close it's within grasp it's it's so close you can taste it it's within reach you can feel its presence it's right there and Peter right into the church is saying but the end of all things is at hand and then therefore he goes and says therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers to be of serious mind, to be of serious heart, not serious in the sense of stoicism where you're emotionalist and, and uh, have no feeling and no thought, and, but rather to have this understanding of the seriousness of it. It's not the time for foolishness and fancy and fables. It's the time to be serious and realize that everything that you say and everything that you do and every step and every decision and every relationship and every circumstance, this is serious business. And he's calling for us to be serious, not just have a serious moment. Oftentimes Sunday mornings can be a serious moment without be serious. Have a, a sober mindset, have an understanding that all that you and I endeavor to see or to do in, in this seen world is what's going to happen? It's coming to an end. It's coming to this place where it's uh, going to come to the place where you, you run out. Do you ever come to the end of something? Even coming to the end of a fine meal, it's coming to the end. Coming to the end of a... Uh, how many people have said, I'm, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm at the end of my, and I feel like I'm going to frail, fray, and come apart. And people in the Christian world, when I first came to the Lord, and uh, people would encourage, and I don't know how they thought this was encouraging, but it says, when you come to the end and you don't know what to do, tie a rope and uh, knot in a rope and hang on. And I don't want to hang on. I want to move in victory. I'm not looking to just be dragged through life. <laughs> like, it's like, what do you even mean by that? It's like, I'm in a hopeless situation, so I'll just hang on and hope for the best. And that's not a conquered life, a conquering life. It's not a hopeful life. Coming to this place where he's calling for you and I to be serious. Why be serious? Why be watchful? Why, be, why, why have eyes to see what, beyond this seen world? Why look beyond? Why do this? Because the end of all things is at hand. That all things seen coming to an end. All relationships that you may hold near and dear, if it's outside of Christ, it's useless. It's coming to a, an end. All endeavors, all vocations, all, all amusement parks, coming to a, and it's coming to an end. All that the world holds valuable is coming to an end. All fame, all fortune, all red carpet experiences, Somehow the red carpet, like people look and say, oh, the red carpet affair, the, the photos of the red carpet, where they came, where they showed, where they, dee, 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 on their, all the kinds of photos going off as they take their looks and they show their suits and their fancy clothes. And, and you, what, you take a piece of cement and you put a red cloth on it and it turns valuable. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. You put on some, you put, take a, a dark room 
and you dim the lights and you put a strobe light in there dee, 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 and all of a sudden it's like wow this is awesome and it's, it's the same dark room that you were in before but it's coming to an end all the amusement parks all the vocations all the sports all the and I enjoy watching sports but just to let you know it's coming to an end all the things that we hold valuable, all the world holds valuable, all the philosophies of this world, all the various opinions of this world, all the religions of this world, all the idols of this world, coming to, coming to an end. Boy, this is depressing for Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you can look at it and say, well, it's coming to an end. All disputes, all arguments, all mocking. All scourging, all smirking, all scorn, coming to an end. All lies, all delusions, all deceptions. The devil himself is coming to his end. The lake of fire prepared for him. The Antichrist, the false prophet, the lake of fire, where all wickedness and all wicked will go. Scary thing, is it not? The lake of fire has no end. But the end of all things that is not of Christ, there's the end. Going in. Scary business. All fame, all fortune, all gold, all silver, all worldly lust, all worldly endeavors, anything that people, all vocations, all, all the things that we hold near and dear. Oh, I just want to have some time to myself and go fishing and go hunting and go hiking. And I just want to go soccer and football and baseball. And people win the World Series and say, this is what it's all about. People win the Super Bowl and they get on. This is what it's all about. I've worked my whole life so I can kiss this thing. <laughs> so it's coming to an end. All the things. I mean, how many people received trophies back in the Assyrian Empire for being the top lion killer? Like, who cares? Here we are now. So many years removed, who cares about who was the top Roman gladiator? Who was the top lion killer of the Assyrian Empire? Who was the top, who was the top, who was the oh, trophy? I get this piece of weed to put on my head and I'm the winner? Like, if, yeah, put this piece of weed on your head and, and you're the winner. You can walk around, you know? I'm the winner, you know? Coming to an end. All of it coming to an end. We try to bring more value to it. People try to find ways to bring value to things and try to give it more value by dressing it up in finer clothes or jewelry or silver. Or try to make ourselves even more valuable. That, uh, yep, sorry, I got this, this $70 suit at the clothing market. Yep, that's, uh, well, it was on sale and I got this top coat for 60 bucks and, well, hey, I only wear and I have this and I have my cufflinks. Don't you love the pastors and preachers who feel they have to have these huge cufflinks to show how successful and anointed they are? I'm sorry guys, I just got the buttons. You know? <laughs> I, that's it, that's all I got, you know? It's uh, trying to put on the special clothes and the ribbons and if I could just have this nice cloth that hangs around my, my neck to make myself look more anointed and more pious and if I could just have a special hat that's made a certain way and, all these things that people do to try to look, it's all coming wow. to an end. All the wealth, all the cars, you know, I, yeah, you and I, we just have the regular old cars out there. We don't have the, the Bugattis and all the other cars that are out there that end with E and I's and all the things out there. <coughs> don't matter. They're all coming to an end. You can have the finest gold bathrooms that have ever been made. You can have the silver and ornate, but it's still for the same purpose that the poor guy has. Right? Yeah. And it's all coming to an end. Coming to this place where every endeavor, all the archaeological digs that people are, they're spending their whole life with a trowel in their hand, looking for some boat, some coffin, some piece of something. Or, look, I found a bullet. Like, oh my goodness, that's tremendous. It's coming to an end. We have to consider this when he says the end of all things, then we have to remember he means the end of all things. And of course, that's what I've been trying to strive home in the past five, ten minutes. Now, we don't want to walk out depressed and say, I'm not doing nothing. Everything's ending anyway. 
right? <laughs> and that's what flesh nature takes a sermon like this and says, you know, mom says, go clean your room. I don't have to. It's ending anyway. <laughs> you know? You know? Well, then I'm not cooking dinner either because it's coming to an end. And I'm not cooking, you know? You know? It's, and people can also approach things in the sense of there's no sense in value in doing anything. I'm not going to church. It's ending anyway. That building's not the church. I'm the church and I'm not going. I'm not doing this. And I don't need to do this and I don't need to do that because it's ending anyway. And a hopeless downcast and rather lift your holy hands. It's downcast hands, downcast lip, walking around, boo, 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 tripping over your own lip because you just won't praise the Lord. The end of all things is at hand, hence the encouragement. It's not the depression, it's the encouragement. That's why he says, verse 8, And above all things, have fervent love for one another. Coming off of verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Next, have fervent love for one another. Love covers a multitude of sins. That's like another step. Verse 9, here's another step. Since the end of all things is coming, I don't want to do nothing. Well, then do this. Be hospitable to one another. Do you want the rest of the verse? <laughs> Without grumbling. Yeah. Coming to this place where you're, you and I aren't the complainers. Have you noticed how easy it is to complain? Yeah. I'm glad I'm totally free of it. <laughs> Why are you laughing so much? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right, my granddaughter. <laughs> Come to this place where you and I have this, this sense in us of to be hospitable, to help, to reach out, to have a welcome, to have a hug, to be there for one another without grumbling. Oh, I got to go help them again. So, got to go do this. I got to go to try. Oh, I got to help. I got to, I got to, I got to. You know, that, that restraint and that restriction we put on our own love. Rather than coming to this place where without grumbling, hospital, well, why should I do this? But the end of all things is at hand. That's why. Therefore, be like Christ. Let Christ come alive in you. He did all things without grumbling. He loved with a fervent love. He was serious and in watchful in his prayers. I'm going to be like him. Verse 10, as each one of us has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the, look at this, manifold grace of God. That's a sermon in itself that I should bring forth. The manifold grace of God, the varied, the varied ways the grace of God shows forth. Manifold is the whole idea of having separate sections of different ways it's diffused. Like a manifold of a car, when an engine is firing off, it has an exhaust manifold. Various ports of the way it, the exhaust makes its way out the back of the, 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 the tailpipe. It comes off like an old eight-cylinder, had eight cylinders and the exhaust pipes on each side and four on each side, four banks, and it would come out and it, would, it was called the manifold, where it would, manifold, it would diffuse, it would come out and make its way out. Or the intake manifold where it would come in, it would come in for a variety of ways into the one place. The manifold grace of God. As each of you has received a gift, the manifold, uh, well you don't do what I do. Yeah, the manifold grace of God coming forth in this gift or that activity or that, that ministry or that, that gift that you have from the Lord to show forth His grace, His glory in your life. And you give it and you extend it to others in the body of Christ. Have fervent love for another. Be serious and watch from the prayers. Be hospital without grumbling. Have received a gift. Minister it to one another. Look at the church body here. Minister it to one another. The church body, the brethren, the saints, the church coming together. Helping, encouraging, edifying, correcting, rebuking, instructing, leading, guiding, giving a helping hand. Come into this place. Where you and I recognize that. And then he starts proceeding with a variety of ways of the way that might look like. The oracles of God. If you've received this, you receive that. Bring glory to God. And he goes through a variety of ways. And then he comes to verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? The need to obey the gospel. We oftentimes see the gospel in the sense of, oh, the good news, baby Jesus has come. 
And we see the gospel in the sense of baby Jesus here at this Christmas time where we come in 2022. And we see all of the varied ways of the gospel came forth. And here, what it's calling for in verse 17 is what? Obedience to the gospel. That since the gospel has come, let us be obedient to the gospel. Oftentimes we get caught up in seeing Christ as the babe and the boy. The babe and the boy. We see him as the babe coming forth and we see him as the boy, 12 year old, uh, conversing with the Pharisees and learning. And we, we don't get past the babe and the boy. But Christ is calling for us to recognize there's an obedience that's called. Because when Christ came, when Christ was birthed, so was the gospel birthed into our presence. The birth of Christ ushered in the end of all things. Hear me now. The birth of Christ ushered in the end of all things. The end of the age, the end of all things. And you and I can look and say, it's been two millennia, it's been 2,000 plus years since that took place. Surely the end of all things isn't coming anytime soon. What a fatal of thinking. Rather recognizing that we draw closer and closer and closer to the end of all things. You wonder what the thoughts were going on in the primeval age, in the pre-flood pre days, the prehistorical, where we don't have any record of it than the Genesis record. There's no written record. It was all, everything, what, what's that word? Everything ended, doomed, historical record, gone, archaeological, gone, all the museums, gone, all the cities that were built, gone, all lives, gone. All many how many lives, how many animals' lives, how, gone, destroyed, and we have no record of it. It was the end of all things of an era, took place, gone, except the promise of the living God that did not perish. The promise continued. And it was passed through Noah and then to Shem. And it was passed through to Abraham and then to Isaac and to Jacob. And we see the covenants being established and then through David and then through all the prophets and then all of a sudden Jesus is, comes. The birth of the Christ, the birth of the promise, the birth of the gospel. And the end of all the ages planted his feet on the soil and breathed air and spoke the word of God. And delivered the gospel message. And he's calling for obedience to that message. What should be the fuel in our fire? Obey the gospel because the end of all things is at hand. When you and I start recognizing how serious this is. When you and I start recognizing how serious of a matter this is. We would no longer cherish and treasure the things of this world. But rather put our number one treasure on the things of God. Recognizing that no matter what they say of you here on this earth, what matters is what they say of you there. What matters is when you see Him. What matters is that you follow faith and you learn from the faithful. Learn the faith and learn from the faithful. Learn the faith and learn from the faithful. Coming to this place where you and I desire to be faithful servants of the living God. He talks in that verse 17 of judgment. And judgment comes. And judgment is coming. And the end of all things is calling for you to recognize that in this world you have sufferings. As it says also in that chapter 4. Sufferings and fiery trials and the sufferings of Christ. And he says if you're suffering because you're doing wrong, then that's not of any benefit to you. But if you're suffering because your name belongs to Christ and you're living for Christ, then great is your reward. Here, looking at unto the, this chapter 4, he's calling for us to recognize the end of all things is at hand. Peter wrote this, but Paul referenced it as well. Looking, Paul referenced it in a variety of places, but in particular, I want to look today at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Would you turn now and flip back to Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The end of the ages, coming to the end of the ages, has come upon us, has fallen on us, is calling for our obedience, 
and the seriousness of it all. Be watchful and serious in your prayers. Here, the end of the ages has come and he's calling for us to recognize this. This is upon the church, upon the brethren, upon the saints. He's writing to the Corinthians, he's writing to a Gentile church and says the end of the ages has fallen. That this whole wrapping up, this whole end, this whole finishing, the whole it is complete, the whole it is done, the whole it is finished, all of it is coming on and has landed on you and I. That the end of the ages and the seriousness of it, that all of these things have taken place as examples for you, upon whom the end of the ages. When he says... As examples, like what things? What things is he talking about? The end uh, has come, the era, uh, the era, the age has fallen, the end of all things has fallen on us, the end of the ages has fallen on us. All these things in that verse, now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition, our encouragement, our correction, our, our edification, our understanding, our warning. Admonition, our warning. So when you look back now in chapter 10, and he starts recognizing what is he talking about, and it says in verse 6, Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. He's talking about the time in the wilderness. Back then when 600 plus thousand men died in unbelief, and their corpses were scattered in the wilderness for 40 years. A death march as God raised up a generation of believers. And he's saying all that took place, all that carcass, all those people in their unbelief, all died. Judgment came upon them. And Paul is writing and saying that was done for our examples, for our admonition, our warning. That the end of the ages has fallen on us. Judgment is going to begin in the house of God. And in this, the seriousness and the prayers that are needed to recognize that Christ has come and the babe and the boy is not the who should we looking at, but rather looking at the one who will judge the living and the dead. Recognizing he's judging the living and the dead. And we can't plead ignorance. And we can't plead and say, I didn't know. We can't plead and say, I tried my best. We can't go there and say, I, I, I tried my best. He's looking for not you to be trying your best. He's looking for you to put your full trust in Him. They also lusted, therefore don't you, in verse 6. Verse 7, do not become idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Wait a minute, I thought idolatry was if you had an idol in your house. and I don't have any idols in my house. I don't have Buddha there, and I don't have some, I don't have Kamesh there, and I don't have all these, uh, the Ra, the sun god, and I don't have Egyptian gods all around, and I'm, I'm not in India where I have 300 million gods in my house and all various idols, and I don't, I don't do that, so I'm good. Which is idolatry. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Putting their own lust, their own desires first, their ways, is idolatry. Putting our own ways before the Lord's ways is idolatry. Putting our own lusts before the Lord, serving first and foremost is idolatry. We serve ourselves, we worship ourselves, we value the things of this world is idolatry. The things that we chase of this world and put first and foremost and excuse Christ and excuse His way so we can have our own way is idolatry. To fulfill the indulgence that rests in our heart is idolatry. He says in verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Verse 9, nor tempt, let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Verse 10, are you following along? Nor complain. Go back to 1 Peter, muttering. Verse 10, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. All things that are not of him. That's why we come to verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples. If they were examples and they suffered death and the destroyer, then how much more the end of the ages has fallen? The seriousness of it. Yes? yes? It's so easy to excuse it and say, well, he just preaches harsh words. Did you forget the gospel? The gospel is calling for your obedience and my obedience. That we obey the gospel, we obey the word of God, we obey the good news, we obey, we follow after, we chase, we pursue, we want this in our life. We want the gospel to come alive in my heart, your heart, our hearts. 
that we are faithful and seek to be faithful and we have become men and women worthy to follow all the way to Christ. And seeing this taking place in our life. Lord of glory, be with us. That's why he says in verse 14, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Flee it. Get away from it. Our own selfish desires and our own lust and our own time schedules and our own ways. And the, it comes to that place where we, we put ourselves first and foremost and, and then give ourselves an excuse and say, well, I'm under grace and God forgives me and he knows. And we give it a bypass. Rather than obey the gospel, we obey our own way and give ourselves a pass. Look, if you would, at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 18, go one book over, chapter 4, verse 18. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The eternal presence. Faith sees. That's, that's why Paul writes, he says, that we walk by faith, that we see by faith. We see the unseen world. We see things unfolding. You get to see things in all relationships, in all circumstances, with the eyes of the Lord. Because all that is seen is the temporary world. All things are coming to an end. It's all ending. All that we see, all even the flesh of our own lives is ending. No flesh will glory in the presence of God. Is that not what scripture says? That included Christ's flesh as well. That includes my flesh and your flesh and that no flesh and no endeavor of the flesh and all the things that we look to hold near and dear to ourselves is all ending. That no flesh will glory in his presence, not even the perfect flesh of Christ crucified on the cross. Raising up a spiritual body. Raising up a, a new creation. Coming to that place of knowing who he is in our life. It's all coming to an end. It's all temporary. Jesus himself said in Matthew 28 20 he said this at the end where before he ascended into heaven he said this in Matthew 28 20 he said teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you always and then he says this even to the end of the age the end of the age saints of God the end of the age has come with the birth of Jesus Christ. The end of the age has come with the birth of Jesus Christ. The, when Jesus was birthed on this earth as a babe, he ushered in the end of the age. The babe and the boy is not where our focus should be, but rather on the gospel message, the word of God that he presented, and he established a new covenant, and he's calling for your obedience and my obedience. Obedience to what? Well, I'll just follow the Ten Commandments. I haven't murdered anyone, so I'm good. And we excuse ourselves from following the entirety of his word and recognizing that he's calling for our obedience to him. His the word. He's the word. And to be like him and to follow after him. And we can do this only by the grace of God coming alive in us. There's nothing in you, nothing in me, nothing we can do to try to accomplish this, to complete this. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. We may try to validate and justify, but there's nothing you and I can do. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Recognizing always that the end of this age is coming. Here in this room, uh, Paul and Gladys, you've spent a lot of time in the past three, four, five years working on, on that house and making it beautiful, and it's a gorgeous job. But I've got news for you. It's all coming to an end. <laughs> I'm down the street now, and you're helping me, and we're working, and Daniel's there, and a number of others, and we're all trying to refurbish this house. But let's all gather together, look at it, and realize this. It's all coming to an end. All right? <laughs> and none of it's going to matter. Uh, everything that we're doing and desiring and chasing and should we and must we? Yes, unto the Lord. Yes. In the Lord, unto the Lord. Do we want to accomplish and strive for excellence and help one another? And yes, we're still in this world. We're still in this body. We're still in this, we're still captured in, in this atmosphere. We're still breathing. We're still part of it. And therefore, we prove ourselves to be zealous in good works. We prove ourselves to be helpful. We must have goals and objectives in Christ to accomplish, to see things done. But recognizing always that the end of all things is at hand. And all things are in His hand. The end of all things is coming. It's at hand, and yet all things are in his hand. There's the trust. Though we recognize that the end of all things is at hand, we also therefore conduct our lives recognizing that all things are in his hands. And we live our lives that way. We trust him. 
adversity comes, persecution comes, mocking, scourging, uh, uh, people say things, write things, do things, act a certain way, and just the troubles of life. I know Pastor Adam was working with me just this past week and work, uh, working at the, at the house, working on things that don't matter, and in this, <laughs> Katie calls up, the car won't start. Car's dead. Just great, huh? Don't you? Troubles come. You, you know, Car, car won't start. Now what do we do? Got to get this, got to get that. Troubles, trials, difficulties come up. And yet, thankful I wasn't in concrete. It didn't start in my own driveway. Thankful, you know? And Pastor Adam's thankful that he, has, he can bring it now to the garage and has a garage to bring it to and pay that big bill, you know? <laughs> Things happen, yes? Troubles, trials, difficulties. We recognize these things that the, even to the end of the age, in all things, who's with us? Christ is with us. I'm with you, lo, even to the end of the age. I'm with the brethren. I'm with the children. I'm, I'm with, I'm, he, Christ Almighty, is ready to reveal the sons of God. He's, he's ready. He's waiting for that day. He's waiting for that last one. He's looking and he's calling and, and he's seeing and, his, and the midnight cry is about to come where the trumpet is sounded and he comes and he hears the, the order, go get my children. The end of all things is at hand. It's all wrapped up. And all of a sudden when you see him and your eyes no longer on that problem and on that difficulty and on your personal offense and on all the, the lust of this world and you lift your eyes and you gravitate it. There's my Savior. And I'm just like him. That's the benefit of it all. That's why James, the half-brother of Jesus, the, the, the son of Joseph and Mary, he wrote this in 5.8, James 5.8. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Establish your hearts. Be immovable, steadfast, planted, fruitful, zealous for good works, believe in God, trusting in Him. Establish your hearts. The last day is coming. The day of all days, you've heard me how many times say, live this day and every day till that day. When it all is wrapped up, you can go out and you and I can accomplish and get rewards and certificates and, and, and do well. And you want to, yes? I want to do well. Whatever I apply my hands to, I want to do well. I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good father. I want to be a good... You want that, yes? You, we want that. We want to uh, put your hands to something and do well for your employer, your job. You want to make more money. You, you want to give more money. You want to do things for others. You want that. But recognizing that all things are in Christ. The end of all things is at hand and all things are in His hands. The end of all things... Gone. But he has all things in his hand. Reminds me of that children's song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. In his hands. That's what he's got. That God Almighty is calling for you and I to believe. To believe God. Ending with these few scriptures so that you and I will capture this. He says in 1 Corinthians 3.21, if you want, turn there. Very important to see what this scripture says. We've preached on it just previously, but just to see how important this is. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Yes, all things are yours. Everything that God is doing, the end of the ages has fallen on you. The end of all things is at hand. Be watchful. Be serious. Prayerful. Hospitable. Without grumbling. Love. Have fervent love for one another. All these things. Establish your hearts. Why? All that has taken place. Coming to this place so you and I recognize that all things are yours. All that, the inheritance, his very personhood, all the divine nature, everything he's doing, all that has gone on in time past, all that has taken place today, all that is about to come, all things are yours. You are his children. You are his brethren. You are his people. You are his treasure. You're his treasure. And where your treasure is, so is your heart. You're his treasure. You have his heart. 
You and I are now to call upon Him and trust. He's our first love. The one we pursue, the one that we promote, the one that we propagate, the one that we trust in. We're after you, O oh Lord. The end of all things is at hand. All things are yours. And he says also in the next letter of 2 Corinthians 4.15, For all things are your sakes. That grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. For all things are for your sakes. He writes it in 1 Corinthians. He says it again in 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, he says, for all things are yours. 2 Corinthians says, for all things are for your sakes. Isn't this important? 1 Corinthians 3.21, all things are yours. 2 Corinthians 4.15, for all things are for your sakes. That is the good, the bad, and the ugly, and all that has taken place, because remember, all things are in His hands. Yes. Recognizing that the end of all things is coming and is at hand, therefore we live our lives recognizing that all that has taken place is proving, preparing, fashioning, forming us, that we would be just like Him. Adversity comes for His namesake, and people say, and people swear, and people are swayed. But in all things, we recognize this, that God is doing a work, and He is preparing us for the kingdom of God. Because all things are for your sake. This is the precious birth of Jesus, the birth of the gospel, calling for our obedience. It's not about the babe and the boy, though we love honoring that, and though, come let us adore him. But if it stops, oh, come let us adore him at the, at the cradle and not the crown, then we blew it. You and I must honor him and adore him at the cradle, where the birth of the gospel came forth, and at the cross, where he gave his life for us, where sin was annihilated, and at the crown, where he calls for our obedience. The cradle, the cross, and the crown is calling for our obedience and our adoration and our veneration. And every new life in Christ should want this, but not every new life in Christ goes after it. Rather, I ask you and I today to yield to the presence of God, to honor Him and to call upon His holy name and to sing songs of praise and to welcome Him and to be serious and watchful in prayer. And you look unto Jesus and you say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. You want the power of His love walking in, working in your life. You want to come to the wedding and you want to be welcomed and not improperly dressed, amen. You and I don't want to have our own ways. As He says in Matthew 22, 4, says, come to the wedding. As Pastor Adam preached before, come and see. He says in Matthew 22, 4, come to the wedding. Hear the invitation of the Holy Spirit to be consummated with Christ, with God Almighty, with God as your Father. To come to this place where you're at the banquet with all the other fellow saints who gave their life and suffered the reproach of Christ and suffered the fellowship of his sufferings. And you and I are gathered together with all the saints because this world is all passing away and yet the eternal is present and the eternal is even now right here in your heart. The kingdom of God. And he's calling for obedience. He's calling for holiness. He's calling for his love to come alive in us. And when his love comes alive in us, it shows up in holiness. It shows up in righteousness. It shows up in believing God. It shows up in trusting him. It shows up in zealous for good works. It shows up with a smile on your face because the smile's on your heart. It calls where you're easily confessing your new life. And you easily confess your old sins that he's delivered you and I from. It says they come to the wedding, and it says, but they made light of it. They made light of it. And then he says this, not willing to come because they wanted their own ways. Not willing to come because they wanted their own ways. Have not we even seen that in our own lives around us? Wanting their own ways. Come to the wedding is the cry of Christ. Come to the wedding. Put your trust in me. Be consummated with Christ. Start now by being faithful to him now. Don't give yourself to the adulterer called this world. Don't give yourself to the adulteress of this world. Don't give ourselves to the harlotry of this world. For God Almighty has said in Proverbs that he, is gonna, he destroys all those who desert him for harlotry. But rather to be faithful to the one who loves you now. To be faithful and have eyes for Him alone. And not to live our lives with peripheral vision, always looking as to what may come our way. Choosing and opting for something else. But to be focused and gazed on. To be focused on the Christ and the presence of the Lord. Why? Because the end of all things is at hand. But have faith. All things are in His hands. Trust Him this day. 
Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be hospitable without grumbling. Extending that welcome. Have fervent love for one another. Zealous for good works. It covers a multitude of sins. But know this, that judgment is coming and already is in the house of God. And God's making a distinction of those who want the Lord and those who want it their own way. And he's calling for you and I to come. To come to Jesus, to come to the wedding, and to recognize that that event is surely going to take place. Picture it now even. I do. I will. I've teased my wife now for 44 years, coming on to 45 shortly. And in this, coming to this place of saying that's a lot of I doing and a lot of I willing. Yeah? I do, I will. I do, I will. Committed to, desiring for, wanting that better relationship. Coming to this place where you and I come and recognize that it's a lot of I doing and I willing and it's a lot of forsaking of that's calling for your attention. And through peripheral lust are calling for your attention to look away. Because wherever you look, that's where you're going. But to stay focused on the one that matters. To stay focused on the one who loves you. To stay focused on the one who gave his life for you. Now give your life for him. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you seal it with an amen? amen? Would you seal it with a hallelujah? hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 May God have the glory. In Jesus' name.